The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome again uh, to the second session of uh, this webinar series in September. And today we'll be talking on curved steel girder bridge. Those who are listening to me for the first time, uh, let me introduce myself to you. This is Arun Sharma from Microsoft, and I'll be covering the uh, covering this session for you. So uh, we'll have a co short question answer session towards the end of the uh, webinar. So you can hold on to your questions and then use the chat windows that are there that are there to uh, communicate with me. I have uh, muted everyone's mic so that uh, in, I can reduce the noise coming from uh, the other ends. I think uh, it's time now and we are good to start. So today as I mentioned we'll be talking about steel composite curved girder bridge and these are this is the overview for the bridge we'll be first starting by defining some materials and sections then we'll create the geometry from scratch uh, I'll model the cross beams and the uh, or the diaphragms uh, into the structure then apply boundary conditions boundary conditions will include the definition of rigid length elastic length of rigid type and the support conditions then we'll apply the self weight and the superimposed dead load onto the structure followed by the live load, uh, uh, live load application. For this we'll create two lanes and uh, they will carry vehicles in both directions. We'll have HL93 uh, vehicles as per Ashto LRFT and in this I'll also uh, try to cover response spectrum analysis as well as live load analysis. After this we'll perform the analysis and review some results. This is the plan of the bridge that we'll be uh, modeling. As you can see here, it's a 200 uh, feet long bridge and has an offset of 30 feet. The, it's a three girder system and the girder to girder spacing is given to be 10 feet. And at the end, it has a rotation of uh, from the main uh, or from the global axis direction of 30 degrees. So what I'll do is go into the program itself and start the modeling. So let me start with a uh, blank sheet here. I'll go to the works tab as a thumb rule so that I can see what all things have been applied to the model so far. I'll right click go into properties and click on materials to define the material properties. I can click add and then select the relevant steel material I want to use. The standard being ASTM and the material be a 70950 w Click OK and then so and so forth I can go and define materials. But to save time what I'll do today is bring in the material properties from uh, a similar project where I have the materials already defined. So I'll just bring the materials and sections from the complete model file. This three set of materials. I'll click OK and I'll import them. I'll come to section tab and import the sections that I'll be using from the same source. Or no, I don't want to import these sections. Let me open a different file. Yeah, probably this one has more sections that we will be using and I don't want to import this section for the time being so I'll take this out. Basically uh, in the section list the program shows you all the sections that are there in the 
model file that you open and you can then choose which ones you want in uh, to be imported so I'll just uh, import all uh, eight uh, all nine except this eighth section so I'll select then select it and take it out from the selected list you can choose to have the uh, to keep the original IDs as one two three four five six and nine or you can start by new ID and that will renumber them as one two three four five six seven and eight so you can choose uh, the two out of the two options I'll uh, choose uh, as the default one and uh, if you happen to have a list of elements of your own let's say a list of sections of your own let's say you have element one two three four here and if you choose to keep the IDs then the existing sections will be replaced by the new section IDs so you have to be a, a little cautious uh, while you are doing this kind of uh, uh, import click OK and now you'll see the sections that we have brought in so if I double click on the girder section you can see its property it's a composite uh, girder that we have defined with the concrete deck and steel girder we have used a section offset to and set it as center top so that we can model the cross frames accordingly I if you double click this is the diaphragm section which is uh, happens to be uh, eye girder and so and so forth we also have tapered sections for modeling the pier elements and for this I'll just click on the tapered section that we have so it is uh, P and S for L this is the tapered section that will form the pier cap left end and you can define the uh, dimensions for uh, the two extreme ends of tapered section so tapered element so this is the let's say I end this will be the chain and you can define how you want to taper it so the y-axis as you can see in this plot y-axis is um, the horizontal axis z is your vertical axis you can choose uh, how they are uh, to be tapered linearly or non-linearly you can select from different variations for the timing we'll uh, stick to linear and depending upon where you choose to have your section offset the depth or the tapering is done so if I choose the section offset at the center top then the depth will be varied so basically this section offset line will remain as it, as it is and the variation will be done about uh, this point in the cross section so if I have uh, the section offset at the center point then it will vary uh, equally a depth equally on either side of this center uh, centroid and uh, if I have it at the center top then only the depth will be varied uh, under this uh, point things will become more clear when I start modeling it and you uh, you will get a better visualization visualization of it so I'll not um, invest much time on it right now so these are the sections that we'll be using and I have defined a dummy uh, cross beam for modeling the deck the thickness of the dummy beam happens to be equal to the thickness of the deck and the width being uh, the spacing that you want to apply the dummy beam it will be modeled based on grillage uh, concepts so uh, the parameter B is uh, at user's uh, discretion how uh, what spacing he wants to have and how much uh, width he wants to give and um, I have used a cross beam material which happens to be weightless because you can see the weight density set is zero and I'll be adding the weight of the uh, concrete uh, or the deck using the composite section itself so you uh, I just want to have the stiffness in the transverse direction for the deck therefore I'm using the cross beam uh, material as weightless now moving on uh, with the modeling so I'll uh, right click go to nodes and click on create nodes I'll switch to the top view and I'll change the length unit from inch to foot and here I'll go and uh, enter the coordinates that I want to create so I'll enter here um, repeat or copy it uh, once and create it at 200 feet along global x-axis the moment I hit apply 
and use the zoom fit button you'll see two nodes on your screen I'll uh, create another node but ch and change the number of times to zero because I don't want to copy it I'll create the node at 100 comma 30 feet and then click apply so you can see three nodes are created in the plan now I'll select all the three nodes that are created by clicking select all and right click go to nodes and translate them so since I uh, mentioned the girder to girder spacing is about 10 feet I'll translate them along y-axis through unequal distance first 10 feet then comma minus 20 feet because these are the incremental distance so I'll click apply and you'll see that the other uh, set of nodes are created now um, the nodes are rotated about 30 degrees about the origin uh, origin at this for this uh, abutment so I'll right click go to nodes and rotate them and in rotation the mode will be moving the nodes I don't want to create a copy and enter the angle as 30 degrees about Z axis I want to rotate and the point of rotation will be origin I'll click apply and you can see the nodes rotated then I'll select the other set of nodes and enter the angle of rotation as minus 30 degrees and the point of rotation will be the centroid of the uh, center point of the other abutment so I'll, basically what I did is I clicked in this field it will turn green this means it is an active field and it will take the inputs directly from the uh, uh, model view window this is the model view window that you are looking at so I need not remember the node number or the coordinate number uh, coordinates of that node if I just take my cursor to that node uh, you can see the coordinates are automatically updated in that green field I'll click here and it will be registered and then I can click apply and you can see the rotation done and uh, I will request everyone to uh, hold on to the questions towards the end of the session so that uh, we'll have some time to discuss all the questions so you can uh, note it down with, you know, with yourself and then we can discuss it and if uh, we are not able to take up all the questions now then uh, feel free to drop me an email and I'll reply to each and every uh, individual now uh, moving on uh, uh, with these nodes uh, generated I'll right click go to elements and select create line elements on a curve this feature allows you to create the geometry uh, uh, a curved geometry as you can see the curve type is arc by three points there are other methods also available you can choose uh, the method most suited for you so we'll choose arc by three points because we have three points uh, on this arc to generate the complete curve and uh, I'll select the material as steel and the section as girder and I'll have uh, this curve divided into 40 segments and I just need to uh, enter three points uh, which uh, lie on this curve so I'll just click on the field P1 click on the first node then directly move on to the second node and then move on to the third node and you can see the curve is created and divided at those at the 40 points into 40 pieces now I'll continue uh, creating these uh, other two girders click on P1, P2 and then on P3 then I'll repeat this for the third one and you can see that the program is able to generate the curve based on your uh, three points I'll just press down the control button from the keyboard hold down the wheel mouse button and rotate the structure dynamically so now here you can see the geometry uh, in the rendering view now having done this uh, I'll 
switch back to the top view and activate the hidden view or, or uh, deactivate the hidden view so that I can see the wireframe geometry of the structure and now I'll create the diaphragms onto this uh, girders so right click go to create create elements and here I'll select create uh, general beam material being steel the section being diaphragm and I'll click on nodal connectivity and just click on the first node and go all the way across it and click there the program will create two elements and divide them at the nodes so this was the first abutment then I'll come to the uh, pier and if I just place my cur cursor I can see the cursor location in the status bar at the bottom of the screen so you can see the coordinate is 100 comma 10 20 comma 10, uh, 0 this means this is central point I'll create another diaphragm here and the last one at the other end so once this diaphragm is created, I'll now create, I'll change the section to bracing and model the uh, cross frame uh, bottom, uh, top chord, which happens to be at every fourth interval. So I'll just quickly create them. I'll leave three nodes and go to the fourth one and create it. So in this manner, the uh, basic uh, geometry is ready. Now I'll show you how to model the 3D cross frames. So for this, I'll click close here and just activate the diaphragms and press down the control button and double click on the bracing section. So you can see them, they are highlighted on the screen. And then I'll click activate. The moment I do this, uh, you can uh, see just the uh, relevant members activated on the screen and uh, let me first show you the geometry of these diaphragms so this is the diaphragm uh, as you can see from on the screen this is the top chord that we have already modeled then we have to model a bottom chord and get the uh, truss members in. So what I'll do is translate these top nodes by the depth equal to the uh, web height and create nodes at the bottom and then connect the bottom cord and then draw the truss members. So I'll switch back to the model itself and first select the diaphragm members along with their nodes. Right click, go to nodes translate the nodes through equal distance mode should be copy not move because we are just want to copy the nodes and the distance should be uh, 76.8 inches so I'll change the units from foot to inch and the distance I'll enter as 0 comma 0 comma 0 minus 76.8 and then click apply then I'll select the remaining bracing members along with their nodes and they will be translated by 74.4 inch and then click apply now if I uh, rotate the structure dynamically you can see the nodes that are created right underneath it so what I'll do is go through the definition of one diaphragm and one cross frame and uh, rest will be done in the same manner so I'll right click go to elements create element I'll select steel material section being bracing the bottom cord for the diaphragm is made of bracing member click on nodal connectivity and then just click on the bottom cord nodes to create the bottom cord and now I'll create the truss member so I'll change the element type to truss section and material properties remaining same and I'll click on the nodal connectivity now I need to connect 
uh, this node to the center of this element or the midpoint of the element. Now if you see at the corner of this screen on my left hand corner, uh, sorry right hand corner you will see uh, a number 2 written there. This means uh, the program will automatically snap a node at the midpoint or divide one element into two pieces. If you want to have uh, the element divided into three pieces you can have this number as three, four, five, so and so forth. So I'll click on the nodal connectivity, click on this member, then move uh, my cursor to somewhere in the midpoint. The program will automatically snap a node at this location and create the element and divide the other element. So let me zoom in at this location so that you can see more clearly. Now I'll continue to create the member the same manner I'll create. So this is how one diaphragm looks like. Now I'll create a cross frame. So I'll change the material uh, element type to general theme and then click on nodal connectivity and then create the bottom chord first. Change the element type to truss and this time since it's a cross frame I don't want the truss members to be intersect and have a node in between because uh, truss members cannot support uh, uh, bending moments or bending out of uh, out of plane bending. So if you have a node at the intersection of uh, truss members, uh, then it will result in singular errors. So, but still I want to have uh, them uh, in the criss in the cr uh, cross shape. So I'll check off this option called intersect at nodes and elements, and then click in nodal connectivity, and then I'll just click on the top node then on the other end click and click so now you can see the element is not divided at this location same way I'll click on the two ends and create a cross frame in no time now as you can see uh, the uh, these two nodes are in the same plane and happen to lie on the same web uh, but they are not connected to each other so for this we'll use uh, an uh, uh, boundary condition called rigid link. So what I'll do is right click go on to properties and select rigid link and as we know rigid link follows a um, master slave node behavior so the node that will govern the other nodes behavior should be made as master. Since uh, our diaphragm uh, the bottom nodes will have the boundary condition assigned to it and we want uh, it to govern the uh, behavior so the bottom node will become the master node so I'll click in the master node uh, number and then uh, let me check off uh, toggle off the single select tool so I'll click in the master node number it will turn green then I'll go to the node and then click on that node the moment I do that the master node number will be uh, read by the program then I'll go on to single select tool and select the node that has to become its slave and then I can specify what type of link I want to have. It has to be a rigid body behavior. Then I'll click apply and the program will generate this rigid link. So let me quickly repeat this step so that you understand how to create um, a rigid link. So I'll select the, mass, uh, the slave node by a single select tool. Then click in the field for master node number and then click on the uh, master node so it will read the number as 124 and then click apply. I'll repeat I'll use single select I'll select the slave node I'll click on the master node number select the mass click on the master node click apply so in this way you can generate uh, master slave node uh, sorry rigid link between master slave nodes the master node is shown by uh, number 11111 this means it's a rigid body all degrees of freedom are restrained are uh, of the slave node is restrained to the master and uh, on the end you'll see this uh, degrees of freedom written is happened to be is called the master node but for the intermediate locations of this cross frame uh, we want the uh, girder uh, basically uh, the node that you see at the top is connected to the girder so we want this node to control the behavior of the uh, bottom node since all the loadings and everything is applied on the uh, top of the uh, girder or on the top node. So we'll make the top node here as master and use single select to select the node at the bottom and then click apply to create at the uh, slave node at the bottom. 
So you can see how this rigid link is created. I'll repeat this step. Select the slave node and the master node and then click apply. Select the master node and the corresponding slave node and then click apply. So in this way you can create uh, rigid links and model your cross frames in three dimensions. So uh, what I'll do is now uh, open a file. File number three in which I have already uh, modeled the diaphragms and the cross frames with the rigid links and you can see them in this layout. I can just right click on any of the rigid link and select display so you can see the slave uh, sorry the master nodes at the uh, at the two abutments and the slave at the top in the intermediate sections. The, uh, and you can also notice that at the peer section we have not modeled any uh, links because uh, we will be modeling the bearings and we will be using different type of link elements at this location. So now let's uh, start uh, the modeling at the pier. So what I'll do is switch to the plan view. And let me undisplay the rigid links for the time being. I'll right click, select and display. And then use single select tool to select the particular plane so that I can select few girders and the nodes underneath it. And then let me click activate. I'll switch to the front view. This is the elevation, the left view where you can see the cross-section at this location. If I switch the solid view, you can see that this is how it looks like. The girder, the nodes are at the bottom. And now I'll translate uh, the nodes for the bearing height and then model the uh, peer cap underneath it. So let me select those nodes first. So I'll select the bottom of the three uh, girders and right click, go to nodes, translate them through equal distance and the distance in the Z direction will be minus 12.4 inches and click apply. So you can see the nodes created here. Now uh, let me first show you the the peer cap. So our peer caps cap look something like this. I mean, I'll taper this. It will finally look something like this. So it will have a tapered ends on either side and a flat section or the uh, non-tapered cuboid in the uh, middle. And uh, so what we need to do is need to get these nodes into place uh, from where the tapering actually starts, where the bearing location is uh, there. So what I'll do is select this particular center node and translate the uh, nodes to get the other uh, locations. And this information can be very easily extracted from your uh, CAD drawings or your uh, uh, PDF drawings where you want the nodes. So I'll go back into the program and select this node and I'll translate them through an equal distance and if I go to the plan view you can see that I want to translate in the global Y direction so I'll just select Y let me switch back to the side view and enter the distance as minus 36 inches comma from that location go one, minus 138 inches comma from that location go plus 210 and from that location go plus 138 and when I click up, uh, the negative distance being on the right side for this uh, display and positive being on the right side sorry on the left side then I click apply here and you can see the nodes created and now I'll go to right click elements create element select the concrete material select the element type as beam select the section as uh, right end of the peer cap and then click in nodal connectivity click on the node and then click on the other end now you can see that 
the section uh, since we set this uh, offset of the section at center top and we gave uh, in the program while defining the stripper section the cross section of this end and the cross section at the final end so the program created uh, a tapered section with these two dimensions at the two ends of the element keeping the top line as constant and varying the height underneath it so this is why the um, section offset uh, this is where the section offset plays a critical low, critical role for defining the tapered sections so now i'll change the section to peer cap center and then click on the other set of nodes to okay, create the center peer cap and then we have the section on the left end and it will have the taper in the reverse direction so uh, now uh, we'll create uh, we'll use a feature called taper section group that will smoothen this curve or the transition by or interpolating the height uh, of uh, the section at the intermediate length because the uh, we know that we can see here uh, this should be the final uh, the depth at uh, the final depth at the uh, let's say the jth end of the member and uh, the ith end of the member and when we have when we divide this into number of pieces the program will automatically interpolate the height of the member in between to make a smooth curve so for doing that I'll just right click go to the properties and select tapered section group I'll enter the name as peer cap uh, let's say R for the right side I'll use single select tool and select the two members on the right side I can set the variation as linear or polynomial the z-axis being the local uh, z-axis for that element which is the vertical axis and I can choose it to be a polynomial curve whereas the y-axis which is happens to be the horizontal axis for this cross section as linear and then I'll click add and you can see the program has interpolated the depth of the section and made it a uniform tapered. Same thing I'll do at the other end. I'll change the name after selecting the members that I want to taper as peer cap underscore left end and I'll choose the uh, from J end I want to have this polynomial curve and then click apply. Let me undo this and show you what uh, will happen if I choose the symmetric plane at I end. Let me select the previous members. Peer cap at left end. If I select in uh, this manner and click add, it will have the taper, uh, the uh, the polynomial curve generated in the other direction. As you can see, this is concave. This will be convex. So. I'll select this and modify to back to J and click modify and it will modify. So this is how we generated the peer cap. Now I'll select this node and create a node at the bottom of the peer cap to model the peer underneath it. So right click nodes translate and I'll copy the node uh, through Z axis or let's say just equal distance. The uh, depth of the peer cap is 6 feet or 72 inches so minus 72 I'll enter here and click apply so I'll get a node at the bottom of the peer oh, sorry peer cap I'll select this node right click go to elements and extrude elements the type being beam material being concrete and the section being peer and I'll give the intervals as minus 62.4 feet 4 inches and repeat it 5 times click apply so if I zoom out you will see the peer created underneath and this is the peer cap that is modeled now uh, if I switch to the wireframe geometry you can see that these nodes are not connected with each other so I'll use uh, properties and go to elastic link and select elastic link or rigid type now a common question um, at this point is why what's the difference between rigid link and elastic link of rigid type 
basically the members uh, whenever you want to create with the uh, infinite stiffness uh, both behave in the same direction but for rigid links you need to have a master and slave node behavior and uh, they cannot be applied in a sequence let's say if I want to have three links in this plane it can it, it will be difficult for uh, me to define as master slave master slave master slave because if a node is uh, if, if one node is master it cannot be slave to another node so there are some uh, technical uh, uh, issues while de when defining them in uh, series the second uh, thing is whatever boundary condition we assign at uh, the master node it is replicated or copied to the slave node loca location so you should be little cautious while defining uh, the rigid links at the boundary uh, at the boundary location like at the end diaphragms if you want uh, to uh, simulate uh, not replicate this uh, boundary uh, condition onto the top of uh, the girder and if you want uh, the uh, to have uh, the uh, real effect of the barrier uh, sorry the uh, bearing uh, location or the support and the height of the section then you should use elastic link of rigid type for those locations uh, one more thing that uh, that uh, elastic link uh, plays a good role in is you can control the stiffness in different directions so if you want to model uh, let's say an expansion bearing you can control the stiffness along those axes and then model it but today we have fixed bearings so I'll not be uh, dwelling much into uh, generating the bearings there so I'll just select elastic ring of rigid type click on two uh, nodes field and then just click on the nodes between which I want to create it and if uh, this is my node, uh, this is my direction of creation of uh, the elastic link, then this is node 1 and this will be node 2. So the direction becomes x axis and you can see uh, if this is x, the, the y will be this one through right, uh, from right hand thumb rule and z will be into the plane of paper or this screen. Uh, you can select to copy the elastic link along y axis and to at 120 inches because the distance between these points is 120 inches or 10 feet so I'll just click on two nodes and click between the uh, these two nodes and the links will be created basically this is the location where you have uh, the uh, bearings so if it was expansion bearing I would have selected general type of elastic link and control the stiffness along these local x y and z axis for displacement and rotation but uh, since it's a uh, uh, we have a fixed condition at the pier and we have expansion bearings at the uh, two extremes uh, that means at the two abutment I'll have fixed bearing at this location I'll use the same elastic link or rigid type for connecting the bottom of the uh, girder to the top of the girder Click on this two nodes. When I do that, you can see the nodes are uh, the elastic links are created and copied at the same time. Now I'll activate the entire structure, which completes uh, the modeling of the uh, links. And now I'll switch to the top view. And as I mentioned, uh, we'll have the grill edge concept applied. So you can right click, go to elements, create elements and start creating cross beams using the cross beam material which happens to be weightless. So I'll use dummy cross beam, click on the nodal connectivity and then go on creating the cross beams like this. So what I'll do is open the next file uh, that I have here which will have the definition completed file number 5 so now here you can see the cross beams have been created and I have, you can see also the support conditions have been defined so what I'll do is quickly delete them and show it to you how the they are defined I'll also delete the loading conditions that are there so defining supports is pretty simple right click go to boundaries go to support and 
select the uh, degrees of freedom you want to restrain at a particular node so I restrain the uh, dy and dz at the two abutments and the exterior girders and these uh, dy and dz are in global direction if you want to uh, apply these restraints along the uh, curve then you can easily rotate the nodes and change the node axis and apply them along that direction as well if you want to do that I'll show it to you in a little while I'll select the four nodes click apply then I'll select the uh, center node and select the direction as DZ that is to be restrained click apply the symbol uh, in itself is explain, uh, explains uh, what degrees have been restrained from 12 o'clock to 6 o'clock dx dy dz are three displacement degrees of freedom whichever is restrained is shown in green color whichever is res uh, released is shown in white so you can see dy and dz are restrained at this end the remaining three are rx ry and rz uh, which means three rotational degrees of freedom since they are all released um, it's shown in black and at the base of the pier we'll have a completely fixed rigid support so it will be all displacement degrees and all rotation degrees will be restrained I'll select the bottom node and click apply so in this way you can create uh, the support conditions now coming back if you want to change the nodal axis you can right click go to node and sorry come to the boundaries because it's related to the boundary function and click on nodal local axis now you can uh, select in which uh, way you want to uh, define the nodal local axis so I can go for three point I'll come and click at the origin for that plane then I'll my next point should be on the x-axis along that direction so this will be this point and then uh, the other point that will, that is uh, that will be any point on this plane will be P2 I can click on this point and then click apply so basically what I did is I applied this point in X this point uh, sorry this point along X axis and this point in the plane so it will be X Y and Z for this node so I'll select this node I'll select this node select this node and click apply so the moment I do that and zoom in you can see X Y and Z for the nodes are rotated and um, the, hence the support will act now along X Y and Z along this correct uh, curvature same thing you can do it other ends and rotate the nodes if you want but this is just meant for demo so uh, I'll revert back to the previous condition and now I'll go ahead and define the uh, load cases so click on load and then select uh, static load case you can enter the name of the load case as self you can select the type of the load case as dead load and then click add and then you can enter the name and uh, select the type as dead load uh, and then click add so we have defined two load cases self weight and superimposed dead loads and now I'll add values to them so right click go to loads and select self weight um, here I'll add the multiplication factor as minus one along Z axis they click add and then uh, and then I'll right click go to element and select sorry go to loads and select element beam load and select superimposed dead load here it will be a uniformly distributed load and I want this load uh, I can choose it to be applied at the centroid location of the element or I can choose it to be applied at the top of the girder where the nodes are actually created so if you want it to be applied at the centroid you can check on eccentricity if you want to be applied at the top of the member you can check it off so right now I'm just applying it to the top of the uh, section so I'll check off this eccentricity and uh, let me just quickly uh, click on this toggle button and select the elements on which I want to apply so this button toggles between the uh, current uh, dialog box and the works tree I'll come to section 
and double click on the girder member so they are selected I'll click on this toggle button again and check off eccentricity enter the values which is minus 0.5 kips per fit um, and then click apply and you can see the load applied onto the structure so once we have defined these two loadings uh, I'll move on and um, apply the live load and before doing that I need to define two structure groups so what I'll go uh, do is go to the group tab right click select new with three dots this allows me to define multiple structure groups at the same time I'll click uh, on this and enter the name as cross beams so I'll create one structure group that will consist of all the cross beam members and other as girders that will com comprise of all the uh, girder members and then click close now I'll come to the works tab and then double click on the girder section so all my girder members are selected now I'll come to the structure group click on girders drag it over the screen and drop it the moment I do that you can see all the girder members are defined into this structure group if I double click you'll see them uh, activated on the screen now you might be thinking that number of nodes is equal to zero does that mean uh, there are no nodes in this group and do we need to define them individually into this group uh, the answer is no whenever an element is included in a group the corresponding nodes are automatically brought in with that structure group so um, all the nodes if you just uh, right click and select active you will see all the nodes along with their girders activated onto the screen so this means the nodes are tied with the elements in this group let me activate the entire structure and now I'll come back to the works tab and select all the diaphragm members and the bracing sorry uh, let me unselect this I just need to select all the cross beams and the uh, diaphragms so what I'll do is double click on the diaphragms and then click the no, press down the control button and select all the dummy beams and um, in the, and now I want to select the bracings so uh, the best way of making the selection uh, will be selection by plane if you click on this icon and select XY plane and click on any point in the plane the entire plane will be selected this will include all the nodes and on the all the elements uh, that I want to select and then I click close go back to groups tab click on cross beams drag it over the screen and drop it so this will have all the elements and the nodes that are included in this cross beam group. Now I'll move back to the works tab and then start defining the live load. So for this uh, there exists a lot of ways of reaching the live load. You can just right click, go to loads and then go into the moving load uh, analysis data and then click on moving load code and select hash to LRFT, click OK or you can directly make use of these shortcuts that are given right in this uh, tab toolbar so you can click on moving tab and then you will see all the options regarding the h 2 lrft live loads shown here so what I'll do is select the first option which is define traffic lanes I'll click add to define the traffic lane uh, but let me just activate the uh, this girder plane so what I'll do is select by plane and this XY plane and then select this plane and activate it I realize I made a mistake let me close this and come back so if I double click on the cross beams uh, I notice I have selected all the girder elements also but I just wanted to consider all the cross beams so what I'll do here is um, unselect everything and double click on just the girder group right click and select inactive so that they are hidden from uh, this display and only cross beams are displayed and now what I'll do is click select all which will select all the cross beams and I'll come to cross beam and then drag it over the screen and drop it so this will modify my cross beam group and now it will have just the cross beam members 
So sorry about that uh, mistake, but this uh, goes to show that how quickly you can mend your mistakes. So I'll activate the entire, uh, I'll activate the previous display. And now uh, come back to select by plane feature, select XY and then click on this tab and activate it. Oops, I clicked on inactivate. Let me activate the entire structure. Select the plane and then click on activate button. Click close. And now uh, continuing with the lane definition, I'll click add here. Enter the name as L1 as lane. Enter the eccentricity as minus 6 feet. And the vehicular load distribution can be taken into account through lane elements or cross beam. So I'll select cross beam and here I've selected the structure group as cross beam. And there's no skew. Uh, you can select the, uh, make the selection from where the eccentricity is being defined, which, have, which is the center girder in our case. So you can either go and click on each and every element to define the uh, layout or you can do it through numbers since it's a curved geometry. I'll go to the top view and display the element numbers. And now if you look closely, you can see 41, 42, 43 and so and so forth up to uh, up till um, 80 is the element number with respect to which we want to define the eccentricity for the lane. So I'll enter 41 to 80 as the element number and then click add and click apply. So you can see with respect to this uh, girder you have defined the lane layout. I'll change the name from L1 to L2, change the eccentricity from minus 6 to plus 6. Everything else remains same. I'll just uh, delete this uh, table which I created and then click OK. Sorry, click add and then click OK. So you'll see the second lane also created. So these two lanes are created here. I'll click close and let me undisplay the element number. Now, uh, as per ASHTO LRFD uh, clause number 3 of live load application, where uh, you need to maximize the negative moment over interior piers and uh, take out the axles that reduce uh, the negative moments and place the place two truck vehicles on at a given spacing on either side of the interior support. So, to take into account these kinds of clauses, Myris will uh, has two special features called lane support negative moment at interior piers where you have to specify the uh, the structure group that comprises of girder elements that are spanning on either side of uh, the interior support. So if, when I click here uh, I select the entire structure group click add and then uh, let me unselect everything and then uh, and let me activate the entire structure and then I need to specify the second uh, 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 thing and that is I, I first uh, specified what is uh, the uh, members that are contributing to this span now I need to specify where exactly is my interior support location so I'll click on this option which reads as reaction at interior support and then I'll use a single select tool and select the base of the pier because all the supports are lying in the same line and then click apply so now the program knows uh, in which plane the supports are then click close and the program will optimize the uh, placing of the vehicle in such a manner that it maximizes the negative moment over interior piers then I'll click on this green icon to create the vehicles and I'll click add standard and here I'll enter uh, H2LRFT load as HL93 truck, the dynamic allowance factor as 33% and click apply. Then I'll change it from truck to tandem, the DLA remaining 33% and then I'll click OK. So two vehicles have been defined. I'll click close. Then I'll click on the uh, second icon which is to define the vehicle class. I'll put the two vehicles together in a class called VC let's say or HL93 then select the two vehicles and put it here click 
OK and close. And then I'll define the vehicle class uh, load group as add and it will be H sorry M V L moving vehicle load. Click add and select this vehicle class from 0 to and minimum number of loaded lanes being 0 maximum being 2 I'll select the two lanes and put it here click OK now what the program will do it will uh, create go through all permutation combinations and uh, find the maximum or the worst loading case for you I'll click close here and uh, now move on to assign the moving load analysis control data I'll go with the default settings. Basically, influence line dependent points are the is is the one that uh, results in uh, maximum bending moment or the maximum forces. Uh, 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 basically, it will apply the vehicle in such a manner that it, it maximizes the uh, bending moments in both positive and negative zones. And with this option, normal press concurrent force, you can generate not only the envelope result but also the concurrent forces that is for a given bending moment what is the corresponding shear and uh, actual force then I'll click OK and now I'll go ahead and define the uh, response spectrum analysis data for this I'll uh, first convert the mass into load so I'll go to structure type and select uh, convert self weight into masses then click and also I'll choose the option called um, lump masses uh, consider off diagonal masses what it does whenever you have used a section offset um, and the node is created at the top and uh, if you don't check this option the mass will be converted the sulfate will be converted into mass and lumped at the top of the girder but for seismic analysis if you want and if this uh, offset is uh, large enough uh, you can choose uh, this feature and have the sulfate convert into masses and lumped at the centroid location for the section. So with this feature you can uh, achieve that easily. Click OK and then um, go to model, select mass and select load to masses and convert the superimposed dead load that is there onto the structure into load and then click, sorry, convert that into mass, click OK and then you will see this kind of uh, I can representation and now you will uh, you can go ahead and define the response spectrum so right click go to loads select response spectrum analysis data select response spectrum function click add and you can uh, create your own set of files or copy paste your data from spreadsheet you can or you can just import a file with response spectrum data in it click open you will get this data brought in I'll name this as RS as response spectrum you can enter a description it's uh, as per ASHTO LRFT you can uh, specify site and soil condition etc etc then click OK and close then I'll go back to loads response spectrum analysis data and I'll select response spectrum load cases and here you can enter the load case name as RS-X for X direction in the XY plane excitation angle being 0 you can choose your modal combination to be based on SRSS, CQC, absolute or linear you can also include the positive and negative signs and for in order to get more details you can just hit F1 from your keyboard and it will take you to the online help page and describe all these features in detail So I'll not dwell much into this since we are running out of time and I'll select the response spectrum that I've defined with the damping ratio of 0 0.05 if you want to add separate damping values at each and every individual node or mode shape you can use this feature to define that uh, damping method you can click here and select what type of uh, damping you want to apply in different modes but right now we'll not uh, uh, go dwell much into this and then click add this is uh, created. I'll create another load case for Y direction. That is global Y. The excitation angle will be 90. And then click Add. So we have defined two functions. Now we'll enter the eigenvalue analysis control. Click on this button. 
select you can select different variations so I will select land shows and enter this um, number of modes as let's say 10 to start with click OK and then click close so once you have done this you are ready to perform the analysis I'll just click perform analysis and or rather uh, in order to save a couple of seconds here I can open the file which has the analysis already done in the meantime while the analysis is running so let me bring up the model file click open and select the final file So now if I, just, this is the analyzed file and if I turn on solid view I have added some colors to it so that it's more vis visually enhanced and now let's quickly go through some results. So right click, I'll go to reaction, reaction forces and movement. First we'll verify whether our loading is correct or not so we'll just check before self fade. I'll click on this button and select self fade and click OK. So now that you can see all the loading is in the vertical direction. So you are getting a summation in F for FZ while FX and FY are zero. And uh, if you can do the number crunching yourself, you can compare whether this value is correct or not. So this ensures a proper flow of forces from top to the bottom of the structure. Hence the loading can be verified. Then you can come to the deformation tab and just uh, check on the uh, deformed shape. Now let's say displacement contour, you can select deformed shape legend and you can click apply and see the deformed shape as shown here. Uh, it's a bit exaggerated, let me put it to like 0.5 but if you see the, uh, uh, if you see the scale, it's, uh, if you see the values, it's, uh, it's just 0 0.004 so let me change it from foot to inch, it is about 0.5 half an inch is the uh, deflection you can see and as you can see the outer girder is suffering the most because of the curvature and uh, the extra length and now we will come to the forces and select beam diagrams and see the self weight uh, bending moment so I will so select fill check off deformed and click apply and as expected the outer girder will be attracting maximum stress value uh, bending moment because of the extra length so all these uh, go to show that the, uh, through deformation we can ensure that the nodes and elements are properly connected. The, uh, through bending moment diagram we can see that we can quickly check whether uh, the diagrams make any sense and the model is correct or not. So once we, have, uh, we are confident that the model is correct and modeling there is no modeling error, we can quickly see some other results like uh, bending moment due to uh, live loads the bending moment envelope. Click apply so this is the positive bending moment envelope that you are seeing and as you can see the outer girder is having uh, maximum uh, bending moment and similarly you can see for negative bending moment envelope you click apply and you can see the uh, bending moment and if you are curious to see what loading pattern caused uh, the maximum negative bending moment at this location you can just right click go into moving load tracer, select beam forces and moment and then select that MV minimum that is maximum negative bending moment and click on that element in particular and click apply and then if I zoom out a bit you can see that there are two um, set of vehicles on either side of the span and the blue color loading is the lane load and you can see the three excels and six V locations and if you notice the value is 14.4 kips which is 90% of the wheel load uh, that is 90% uh, of 16 kips so the program has reduced the loading value as per the uh, uh, the code clause and applied it so through this you can uh, uh, quickly verify whether your loading pattern or the analysis or the live load analysis makes any sense or not or if you have done something wrong in modeling so uh, in this way you can verify your results visually if you want to see the influence lines uh, for let's say uh, bending moments and forces let's say for one of the line and I want to animate it so I'll click 
Uh, let me turn it in this direction so you, that you can see how the vehicle is moving onto the structure. Click apply and then I'll click record button and the program will uh, show you the animation for generation of influence line and there you will be able to appreciate how the complete 3D geometry is playing uh, the role in uh, uh, transferring the moments from one girder to another and from girders to the peer cap and I can see uh, some uh, viewers asking questions so what I'll do is uh, hold on to these questions and since we are uh, overshooting the time I'll reply them uh, individually in, the, in an email so while this influence line is being generated uh, I'll quickly open the analyze model that we were doing in the first place and the total analysis time was 30 second and I'll show you the vibration mode shapes in the meantime so I'll come to result and go into vibration mode shapes and now here I can select let's say mode shape 1 and, the, and along with the legend the program will show you what is the uh, percentage mass participation this is the first mode shape second mode shape you can choose to display multiple mode shapes in the same time so let's say I want to see four mode shapes click apply and the program will divide the entire screen into four parts so mode 1 mode 2 mode 3 mode 4 are shown simultaneously so you can see different mode shapes in the same display let me close this so once you have verified the uh, mode shapes uh, you can see them in a tabular format also so you can see the 10 modes and the modal participation in different axes so you can see for X and Y it has reached uh, 97 and 92 percent and Z it's uh, falling short so uh, you can choose to go on with the eigenvalue analysis let's say uh, next time 1 to 20 and in this manner you can see and find out how many mode shapes will be sufficient for this type of bridge and uh, you can also uh, visually and uh, 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 through these numbers verify which will be the principal mode in different directions for example if you see here uh, you are getting uh, very low participation uh, for the third mode shape in Z direction so uh, let me go to third mode shape and click apply and if you see uh, from this angle you can see that the mass that is going above this neutral axis for the uh, bridge and below the neutral axis of the bridge is almost equal so therefore this mass is cancelling each other so if I were uh, to choose the principal mode shape uh, for Z direction I would have gone with the results for this mode shape instead of uh, going for the fourth mode shape which uh, will look like this as most of the mass is above the neutral axis so you're getting a, a good mass participation uh, value so through this uh, 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 visual interpretation you can make out uh, which happens to be the uh, critical mode shape or the principal mode shape for a given axis and this is where the software has its advantage now I'll show you how you will get the uh, capacity for that uh, for a given section let's say I want to have it see it for peers so let me right click or switch to the initial view right click go to deform displacement contours and activate just the peer assembly and I uh, use uh, let's say in the X direction right click uh, sorry click on deform and legend and this is the displacement that is occurring during the uh, response spectrum along X axis and this is the demand you can see at the top is uh, quite less if I convert into inch it's about like 0 0.004 inches um, you can see it in the y direction also and this is the demand in the y direction so in this way you can easily extract uh, the demand values from response spectrum let's see how much is the peer deforming and if you want to see the global picture you can activate the entire structure and see the global picture again it looks exaggerated so you can uh, reduce the scale to get a more realistic display you can even animate these results
So this is how you can extract and uh, do the response spectrum in Madisible. Let me come back to the other model file where the animation file is completed. And here you can see the influence line animation and the forces that are coming onto the structure and how the uh, notice how the peer uh, assembly is interacting with the girders. So in this way you can see uh, the true 3D behavior being replicated in the model. So this is all I wanted to uh, share with you today in this webinar and highlight uh, uh, how the uh, 3D bridge geometry can be generated for curved steel structures and modeling the cross frames um, and uh, how live load is uh, applied onto the structure, how uh, geometry is generated by the use of different type of uh, boundary conditions uh, that includes rigid links, supports and elastic link of rigid type, how you can taper sections and model uh, peer caps and peer and uh, uh, how you can apply response spectrum in particular, eigenvalue analysis and how uh, visual uh, interpretation can play a uh, critical role in assessing the uh, governing mode shifts in different directions and uh, how you can extract the capacity of the uh, structure and uh, how you can see the uh, verify your live load results in the software and uh, how you can uh, see whether the program has generated reliable results or not through moving load tracer. So this is uh, all I covered and uh, summarized in front of you. If uh, due to the time crunch, I'll not be able to take the questions right now. So you, I'll put up my contact details for you. So you can reach me at my uh, contact through email or phone and I'll be more than happy to uh, take care of your questions. Once again, uh, thanks a lot for attending this session. Hope you find it useful and I look forward to hearing from you for your feedbacks and comments as they are uh, very important to us.